Uh, so this particular pack from Mystery Ranch is the one that I'm running these days. It still looks like a civilian pack. It just happens to be gray. That's not because I'm going gray, man. And it's very streamlined. Everything's kind of contained inside. It doesn't really stick out that much in a crowd. It looks very unassuming. So this is the Urban Assault 24. Uh, and this is plenty big enough for my 19 pound bug out bag. Uh, extremely durable, extremely well made and very, very comfortable so that I can carry it over an extended period uh, for long distances and I'm not gonna get uncomfortable, which is kind of a key concept to getting from point A to point B. So it starts with the Urban Assault 24, which is a great pack that I highly recommend. But again, it doesn't have to be this one. You can use whatever one you're comfortable with. This is the one that I choose to use. So that's what it starts with is the pack. From the pack, I break that down into the priorities, into the needs that I'm trying to provide for. Core temperature control is obviously the first thing that I'm trying to provide for. So in a survival situation, you know, starting a fire is not that, not that big of a deal. Um, from a prepper's perspective, from a preparedness perspective, you may be in a situation where you don't want to start a fire. So there is a such thing as a permissive and a non-permissive environment, and you need to understand kind of the, the situation that you're in. Uh, permissive environment means it doesn't really matter if you're seen, if you're found, if, if it doesn't matter. You're just providing for your needs like everyone else out there. Whereas a non-permissive is the opposite of that. A non-permissive means that you're, you're kind of using a little more stealth. You're trying not to be seen. You're trying not to be found. For a non-permissive environment, fire is probably not your best idea. It's probably not a good idea, right? Unless you're in an extremely cold weather environment and you need the fire, you, you probably should not rely on that. Non-permissive environment, you're gonna rely very heavily on your shelter system. So we'll look at the fire kit first. And I like to have three different methods of ignition, all right? The first one and the primary one should be just a normal Bic lighter, okay? That's the easiest way to get a flame. That doesn't mean you get a fire. You need to be able to put all of this together into a fire lay using tinder resources, etc. But you know, the easiest is the Bic lighter. You should not be relying on primitive methods in this type of emergency. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. These are not exactly the most durable thing in the world. I can't count on making one of these for, you know, years. They're not gonna last for years. But something that will last for a very long time is a ferrocerium rod. A big uh, three, three eighths to, to half inch diameter by five to six inch ferro rod is the best way to go. Uh, this is a really easy way, if you know how to use one, to make a fire and it's extremely durable. There's no moving parts. It doesn't matter if it gets wet. So this is a simple wallet Fresnel lens. And if you know how to use these and the sun is shining, this is a really effective way of starting a fire. If you have the ability to use this, you're taking nothing from your kit. You're not taking anything from your resources. As long as the sun's out, you can continue to use this without depleting any other resource. If it is an actual emergency, you want something that you can get a fire going right now, really quick. I like to use, you know, some sort of man-made tender that's ready to go so I can get a fire going really easily. And what I've been carrying for probably the past year or so are called mini infernos. These are uh, basically a cotton round that is soaked in an accelerant. And then that entire thing is dipped into a paraffin wax, which solidifies around it, seals that accelerant in there. Whenever it's time to use one of these, you just break those open, expose some of those fibers, and it'll take, obviously it'll take open flame and it'll take a spark. So that is an awesome resource to have in your kit to use in an emergency to get a fire going quickly. There's several in here and that comes with a reusable tin. When these start going low, I can char natural material in this and I can use that. A lot of different things you can do with a tin. Another thing that I like to use kind of as a secondary light source for doing things in the evening, if I'm not so worried about drawing a lot of attention to myself, uh, that also makes a valuable fire resource is a simple beeswax candle. Now these are four hour nano candle tins from Exotac. Each one of these little tins will burn for four hours and it just gives me a small light source or a method of drying out natural tinder to get it going. And I can also use the candle as a lighter extender. From a shelter kit, every shelter kit starts with, basically has the same things. You have something to sleep under, you have something to sleep on, you have something to sleep in, 
and then you have some cordage to kind of put all that together. A lot of what I carry is not applicable to someone that lives in the southeastern United States or lives out in the desert. It's not applicable. However, something to sleep under, something to sleep on, something to sleep in, and some cordage is applicable everywhere. It's just you may need different components to provide for those needs in your particular kit. But a good baseline kit, something to sleep under. I like to use the military style ponchos. This particular one is from Helicon Tex. Uh, it's been one of the best ponchos that I've had outside of the military. And the reason I like the poncho is because it's actually two pieces of kit in one, okay? If I'm on the move, on the go, and it's wet weather, this poncho will keep me dry and I can drape it over my backpack to keep the contents of my backpack dry. And if I'm stationary, then I can actually produce my shelters with this. So that's something to sleep under to protect me from the elements. A lot of days, a lot of nights, a lot of weekends, a lot of time in the military that I had was spent in nothing more than wrapped up in a poncho liner with a poncho around me, just in what we call a ranger burrito. Even in a, in a quick nap and I don't have time to set anything up or maybe I found a natural shelter, I can wrap up in both of those and sleep fairly comfortably in a lot of different places. Obviously not in the winter in the Adirondacks, I'm not gonna do that, but it's a good baseline. So something to sleep under, something to sleep in, something to sleep on. I still go with the Snug Pack SF Bivy. It's very small, it's lightweight, and this is basically a Gore-Tex cover if you will, that's kind of like a mummy, kind of like a mummy liner kind of thing, uh, that you can put around the whole kit and caboodle. But the other thing about this that I like is that something to sleep on. I can stuff this with brows like leaves or any other sort of kind of soft debris to kind of contain that, and I can make a brows mattress, lay on top of that, that's gonna prevent conduction with the ground, and it's a real small package. I can also, add this to the Ranger Burrito, wrap the entire thing up in that, and it's gonna protect me even that much more against the elements. So I think the versatility of a small baby sack is a good thing, and that's why I continue to choose to put that in my baseline kit. That's my sleep under, sleep in, sleep on system. Then I like to have cordage to kind of put it all together. One of the main components of my shelter system, I call the Rapid Ridge Line, right? This is a ridge line system that is easy to deploy, easy to take down, uh, and it's pre-cut, pre-kind of hanked so that it comes out quickly. Uh, and I can do, you know, three different shelter configurations depending on the weather conditions off of this really quickly. This is just about 25 to 30 feet of paracord and some number 36 bank line. All right, so that's my main ridge line that I use for a number of different shelters. And then the rest of my cordage, I'm just using number 36 bank line. And I'm choosing bank line over more paracord because paracord tends to have a more slick outer sheath, so it doesn't hold knots as well. This is tarred mariner's line, bank line. Uh, this has kind of a sticky tar on it, so it holds knots really well. It's a thinner diameter, so it's not quite as strong. This is normally 550 pound test. Uh, number 36 is normally around 300 to 350 pound test. But when I'm establishing a shelter, you know, just because paracord is stronger does not mean that this isn't strong enough. 350 pound test is plenty strong enough for a lot of the applications that I'm using it for. So those are my cordage, uh, my cordages of choice, just a, a ridge line, a dedicated ridge line. The rest I do with number 36 bank line. And this actually is made up of three individual strands. So if I needed smaller stuff for gear repair or for fishing or for trap components, I can break this apart into three smaller strands that still have a tensile strength of about 100 pounds each. And then kind of, I guess, the difference between like a, a survival situation, bushcraft type of thing is I can make tent stakes while I'm out there. It's very simple, they take just a few minutes, but that's one more thing that I have to worry about. And for me personally, I just don't think it's worth not carrying these because they, they just don't take up enough space or cost me enough weight to justify leaving these back and then carving stakes out in the field. Uh, these are titanium, these are MSR groundhogs. Having lightweight tent stakes is a time saver, it's a convenience thing. Will you die without them? Of course not. Can you make them in the field? Of course you can. Uh, me personally, 
I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze on that. So I'll carry six of these uh, and all of my shelters can be made with those six. With our core temperature under control with our fire and shelter kit, the next kit and the next priority that we need to talk about is hydration. You have to stay hydrated, especially when you're moving long distances. The water kit that I choose to carry these days is, one, you need a method of procuring it, you need a method of storing it, but you also need a way to disinfect it so that it's safe to drink. I'm going to be filtering water from these water sources because this is something I need to do quick. I don't want to rely on having to make a fire and boil every time I need to drink. So carrying a dedicated filter is a good idea. The filter that I've been using for probably the last year is the Grail GeoPress. Uh, what I like about this is not only does it filter, but it's also its own container. So it gives me additional capacity to carry more water than I used to carry when I only carried just the 32 ounce stainless steel water bottle. So that is an outstanding piece of gear. And what I can do is when I get up to a water source, I can filter once the filtered water or once the water's filtered, I can fill up my 32 ounce container and then I can leave this full and I've got two containers of water. So that's primarily what I'm going to be doing. If I had to, I could also boil water because my other container is a single walled stainless steel container. This is the Pathfinder stainless steel 32 ounce and that comes with a nesting cup with a lid. All right, so that's all part of the same water system, but I could also use this to cook in. I can make medicinals in this if I want to go down that road. Uh, I can make charred material in this. I can make charred material with these two. So this entire system works together really well, but it starts with being able to filter water to make it safe to drink and store enough of it to move from point A to point B. Another thing that I kind of include in that kit, even though it's more versatile than just for water, is a cotton shemag, right? This is a, a three foot by three foot piece of cotton material. That could be used for a number of things. It can be used, you know, in the capacity of the fire kit. You can actually use this to make char cloth if you don't have any natural material that you can char. Uh, that makes all your subsequent fires that much easier. If I don't want to filter this, I could use this to place over water in a stream and pre-filter that which is really you know, a redundancy considering I have this, but if I don't wanna clog this filter and I wanna pre-filter the water before I put it in the container, I can do that. Uh, it's just really handy to have for that. And then of course, we haven't talked about the first aid yet, but this is, cotton material is very valuable for bandaging, for an improvised tourniquet, number of reasons. So with your hydration taken care of, then we can talk a little bit about consuming calories because we talked about needing to have energy to get from point A to point B. You're gonna burn a lot of calories. You're exposed to the elements, you're under stress, you're moving from point A to point B. Uh, so you need to be able to consume calories. What you don't wanna do is have to hunt for food. You don't wanna to have to stop and trap. You don't wanna to have to stop and actively fish. Uh, and then if you do catch something, you would have to actually start a fire to cook it or preserve it so they can move on. Those skills are valuable to have, but they should not be your primary means of consuming calories. That's why I like to carry some sort of pre-made ration that doesn't require any cooking. And I still like to go with the SOS emergency food rations. These are very small, they're very small packages, they're very simple. You just break out the bars and you eat them and it gives you some calories. You can do that while you're on the go. You don't have to stop to prepare anything. Uh, so these are valuable. This is a 3,600 calorie bar. Um, so this can get you this can get you a couple days up the road before you need to replenish. Speaking of point A to point B, you wanna get there as efficiently as possible. So that is where your navigation kit comes in and the ability to navigate comes in. For navigating, you know, obviously you wanna have a map of your area or be extremely familiar with your area. Um, at a minimum, you would need a compass. Right? I recommend the Sunto MC2 compass because it has a lot of other functions. It has a magnifying lens that I can use as part of my fire kit to start a fire using charred natural material or charred cloth. It also has a, a mirror that I could use for signaling, and I can also use it for first aid applications for things like if I get something in my eye or on my face that I can't see, I can use that in the kind of a first aid application. So. Aside from that, you know, it's obviously used to walk a straight line, get from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. So I love the Sunto MC2 compass. I also use these pace beads, all right? These pace cords, if you're not familiar with those, sometimes people call them ranger beads, but rangers don't call them ranger beads. We just call them pace beads. But that gives you the ability to keep track of distance traveled as you're counting that with your pace count. 
you know, you're basically counting steps from point A to point B. So every one of these is 100 meters, and then every one of these is 1,000 meters, and you just kind of reset. So I do recommend having a map. Uh, I get all of my maps from MyTopo USA, but that's where I get all my maps from. So if you need a map of your particular area, that's where you can get them. Uh, you can get them in MGRS at Grid Reference System. You can get them in UTM. You can get them in Lat Long, whatever you want. So recommend you have those. If your compass does not have the ability and it doesn't have scales and you can't use that as a protractor to determine coordinates and translate that map coordinate, then you may need to carry a protractor. If your compass does have that, you don't necessarily need this if you know how to do that. But that is part of a nav kit. The other thing I'd recommend is a couple of mechanical pencils and some waterproof paper, a waterproof notebook. All right, this allows you to record things. This allows you to make updates to your map, take notes, keep track of a lot of different things. And yes, you could use a regular pencil. Uh, and that regular pencil could be used and because you, you can resharpen it and all that. Uh, in the military, uh, we use nothing but mechanical pencils. Not so much that they're more durable, but because the point is a lot finer. And when you're talking about navigation, you, you want precision from point A to point B. So when I'm plotting coordinates, I want as fine a point as possible. I don't want a big fat point because it's gonna make it less efficient. So I always carry mechanical pencils as part of my navigation kit. North American Rescue is a company I trust that I used them in Iraq and Afghanistan for you know, 11, 12 years, however many years it was. Uh, so I trust them and I'm really happy to be partnered with them to make my very own IFAC. And even with my own IFAC, I still supplement with a couple of other things. And everything that it has in it, I'll talk to you about it real quick, it has a Fort March massive hemorrhage. We're using a tourniquet. We've got some combat cause, which is a hemostatic that you can pack inside a wound, uh, be it an extremity or a junctional injury. Uh, it also has some S-rolled gauze that you would chase that with to really pack that wound cavity. And then you have a four inch flat pack emergency trauma dressing, All right, You can use that for pressure dressings. You can use that for pressure on junctional areas where you can't get a tourniquet. So that's all with the massive hemorrhage in mind. And then we get onto airway. It also has a, an NPA, a nasopharyngeal airway uh, with some lube so that it's easy to insert into the nostril. Uh, and then for sucking chest wounds, which if you're not familiar with this, again, anything in this kit, if you're not familiar with it, you need to get training on TCCC or TECC. That's Tactical Combat Casualty Care or Tactical Emergency Combat Casualty Care minus the combat. TECC is basically the civilian version of TCCC, which is for the military, but I think you can still get those classes. Just look for some in your area and get the training. Highly recommended. But even if you don't have that training, if you're carrying this, maybe somebody that happens upon you, Good Samaritan, has the training, knows how to use it, they just maybe don't carry it. So you should always carry the things that you need to sustain your own life or somebody else can sustain yours with it. So MPA uh, is for your airway, for your, uh, for your sucking chest wounds, any wound basically from, from nose down to navel, you need to start thinking about a sucking chest wound. Uh, and the chest seal is used to seal that up. And this is a hyphen vented chest seal, so it's already vented. You just slap it on. It comes in a two pack because wherever you have an entrance wound, you probably also have an exit wound. You could have multiple entrance wounds with no exit. And you know you don't know what you're gonna run into. So at a minimum though, you have two chest seals in there and that's for your respirations. Uh, and I also added, which is not really common in a lot of IFACs that I see. I also added some two inch flat surgical tape. Uh, it's really convenient to carry that over the roll and then that, what that allows you to do is not only have some surgical tape for minor injuries or whatever, but you also have that tape so that you can use any of the wrappers from anything in this kit. You can improvise a chest seal with that, an additional chest seal. If you have multiple gunshot wounds uh, and you don't have enough dedicated chest seals, you can use the wrapper from the chest seals, the wrapper from the pack. You can use all these wrappers because they're, they're, they're going to be able to, to be improvised in a seal as long as you have some tape to make that stick. Uh, so that's been added in there. And of course, for personal protection, you've got some black talon nitrile gloves, uh, non-latex for people that have allergies, but that's what's inside the kit. And I put the tourniquet, I put one cat tourniquet inside the kit, but I want you, if you've ever taken a class with me medically, then you know that two is one and one is none when it comes to dedicated tourniquets. If the first tourniquet doesn't stop the bleeding effectively, the very first step, the next step, I should say, is to apply a second tourniquet. And a lot of people are only carrying one tourniquet. Uh, so there's 
the one that's inside, sealed inside the pack in the IFAC, think of that as your second tourniquet. And I carry an additional cat tourniquet. That's the one that's in your pocket. You can reach it with both hands. This is your primary tourniquet, but this is a supplement to the one that's in the IFAC. If this one fails to stop the bleed, you've got another one to go to and you don't have to go to improvising a tourniquet. And I don't recommend improvising life-threatening measures when you have the ability to actually have adequate equipment for it, all right? Improvising is something you do when you're not prepared. Carry a pair of trauma shears so you can rapidly open up and expose that wound, uh, take the clothes, strip them down so that you can see what you're actually working with. Because again, in a life-threatening bleed or a gunshot wound, you don't know what you're, you're dealing with. You need to open up, look at it, so you know what to use as far as resources to stop that and hopefully protect life with it. And a lot of times, you know, for hyperthermia prevention, which also plays into shock prevention, that can be the function of your, your clothing as your primary shelter and your shelter kit. You know, that, that also prevents, but this is, this is kind of a rapid way to do it. And for the space and the weight, it just makes sense to just throw a quick mylar blanket in there and kind of think of that as part of this. Could I also in cold weather use this inside of a shelter to reflect heat off of the fire if that's the situation? Yes, you absolutely could. But you know, I, I prefer to think of these as, as kind of a supplement to both the IFAC and the shelter kit to kind of help with that core temperature control. So that is the GB2 branded IFAC from North American Rescue with the recommended supplements. I keep all those inside my go bag. This is the gray bearded green beret, the GB2 Puko that I made, I designed. Uh, that's available on the market. It's made by Pathfinder Forge and Tool. This knife has a full tang, but it also has, with the Puko style, that continuous curve, it has kind of a delicate tip. It's used for fine carving. If you're inexperienced with a knife, there is a chance that you could shear the tip of the knife off. If you're trying to bang this thing through hardwood or through a knot or something like that, that you shouldn't be batoning a knife through anyway. Uh, most woodsmen would know not to do that, but a lot of folks in the general population that really don't have a lot of experience with it, this may not be the knife for you. As much as I hate to say it because I designed it, it's, it's the truth. While this is a great knife in the experienced hands, it may not be the knife for everyone. It may not be the best choice for your bug out bag, but I'll let you be the judge of that, even though this is my design and the one that I carry. I still stand by the Mora Garberg as the knife for everyone. Uh, it's Again, it's a full tang as well. It's also a Scandi, but it's not a Scandi to zero. It has a secondary micro bevel on it. So rather than the angles coming together, it has an additional very small angle at the bottom that gives that edge strength. It'll keep you from chipping it. Um, and the design of this is a little bit thicker at the tip. So the chances of busting that tip off is a lot more slim. So I'll leave that up to you. Uh, these, I recommend both of these knives, but I recommend them for different reasons. In addition to that, I recommend some sort of a multi-tool. Uh, in my bug out bag, my go bag, I typically keep a Leatherman. And there's a lot of models out there, a lot of different models. And you can, maybe you prefer Gerber, maybe you prefer a different brand. The brand's not important. Again, it's the, what you're using it for, the function. That's what's important. But when you're looking at a multi-tool, the three most important tools on a multi-tool for me is a secondary blade, that's a backup blade to this, some sort of a saw, which, you know, going from point A to point B, the need for sawing is not that great, but it's nice to have a saw just in case you need it. This is obviously if I, I was expecting to use a saw a lot, I would want a dedicated saw, but if I'm not expecting it, it's just not worth the wait. Uh, so having this as a saw that you can call on if you need one is a great thing. So those two tools plus the third tool that I think is most important, especially for gear repair, is an awl, uh, which this one may not actually have one. There's the awl. Hey! Exactly where the 30 seconds is, right? You can, you can gray that out and put it in there, can't you? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. There's the awl right there. Really the only thing I've found that I need pliers for in the wilderness is if I start using snare wire. Uh, there's not a lot of other things. I don't need screwdrivers in the forest. I don't really need pliers or wire cutters in the forest unless I'm using traps, so that's another reason. That's really the only reason I use these. Primarily, I carry this Swiss Army knife, and of course, it has the three things that I look for in any multi-tool. It's got a backup blade that's a good size. It's got a really good saw that I can use, and it also has an awl that I can use to bore holes in material. I can use this to sew and repair gear, 
But those are the three most important tools that I think you can have on a multi-tool. What type you carry, whether it's a, a Swiss Army style or a Leatherman style, that's up to you. Uh, what brand, that's up to you. Lastly, you could kind of in, in, a, in an emergency kit or a survival kit, you may consider this you know, kind of a signal thing. Uh, but I kind of put it into the tools because in my, the context of my go bag, you know, I'm not really trying to signal anyone. Um, at, at the most, I might be trying to signal someone in my community at the alternate bugging location that I'm heading to. I found this Princeton Tech Viz. And what I like about this one is, is the default is red on this one. So it doesn't matter, you hit the button, it's gonna to default to red and you actually have to hold the button down to change it to white. It also has a green, a blue, which is really useful for blood at night. And uh, it also has an infrared if you're somebody that has, has developed your preparedness so far in, into the weeds that, that you've got night vision. You can see that only with night vision. I just like that it's a default to red that solves that problem. And this has been a really good headlamp that's worked really well. Uh, and the battery life on here is pretty good, but you don't know how much you're going to be relying on this. Um, so it's always good to have some extra batteries. And if you're going to carry extra batteries, I recommend you carry the lithiums because they're going to last a little bit longer. So that's kind of the toolkit that I recommend. Don't focus on the brands. Don't focus on the specific things that I choose to provide for those needs. The focus is the needs that I'm using this stuff to provide for. And then you tailor that to your situation, your experience, your skill level, your environment. And you know, again, the brands aren't what matters. It's, it's what tools am I packing for what needs? What needs are you providing for with that bag? Is the audio good or no? Audio's good. Yep. Audio's not Real good. Real nice, Clark. Yeah. Real nice. <laughs> now, where were we? Uh, 23.